Good morning, everyone. Thank, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm actually relieved to see so many people in the room. I was telling somebody this morning that I was afraid the word had gotten out that the internal auditor was going to be at the podium. And we might have an empty room to talk to. Um, my name is Whit Madera, and I'm the director of the <coughs> audit and consulting team. And my responsibility is to support all 23 of our community colleges, as well as the system office and our new shared services center. Um, what's drawn you all to the room isn't, isn't to listen to me, but to listen to the, uh, the outstanding leaders that we have to my left on our panel. Um, when I asked them for uh, some information, how they'd like me to introduce them, one of them sent me a half a page in small font, and the other one sent me uh, two bullets. And so they got together amongst themselves and decided less is more, and so we're going to keep the introductions uh, very, very brief. Um, farthest to the, uh, to the left is um, Dr. Frank Friedman, the president of Piedmont Virginia Community College. He has 40 years as a community college um, a faculty member or administrator, including 12 years as a chief academic officer and then 18 years as the PVCC president. Uh, then we have in the center uh, Dr. Gary Rhodes, who has 38 years. Oops, wait a bit, wait a bit. You guys have to switch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We'll take Dr. Gary Rhodes as the closest one to me. I hope you audit better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, are you in trouble now? I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, that, that was East Step, not Rhodes who said that. That was Gary Rhodes who said that. It depends which pair of glasses I have on. This one's for seeing close, and without them, I can see you better. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> you will be. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll plan a visit. <laughs> Dr. Rhodes has been in, uh, in higher education for 38 years, uh, 19 years as a college president, and this is his 15th year at, uh, at Reynolds. And then um, Mark Estep in the middle. Uh, 36 years in higher education, 25 as an administrator, and then 10 years as the, the president at um, Southwest Virginia Community College. Uh, the books that we're going to talk about today, there are two of them. One of them is Good to Great. This is, some of you have probably read uh, Good to Great. Um, this is a management book by Jim Collins, and uh, uh, it, it describes how some companies transition from a good company to a great company. It talks about how many companies, most companies, fail to ever make that transition. Uh, it was published in 2001, and it has, uh, it has been nominated by several of our presidents for the chancellor's um, uh, professional reading list. And uh, that includes the, the, the presidents that you see over here to my left. Um, this book, is, like I said, it was published in 2001. It very quickly became required reading for a lot of people in MBA programs and, uh, and master's degree programs. Uh, so it's a very well-read book. The, the follow-up book is a very short, a thin one, but this is Good to Great and the Social Sectors. And what it does is talk about the, some of the relevant topics in Good to Great, but how they apply to government and, uh, and not-for-profit uh, organizations. <coughs> to, uh, to, to talk about these books, I'm, I'm going to first address, we've just got a couple of questions here, but first I'm going to address to uh, uh, Dr. Estep and, and, and Dr. Rhodes, uh, why, why this particular book? Why Good to Great? Uh, what makes it uh, worth reading compared to other books on the Chancellor's reading list? And in particular, are there any uh, concepts from the, books, uh, from the book, anything that you learned that you're actively uh, uh, implementing at the colleges where you are today? Well, one of the things I really uh, liked about Good to Great, and I was introduced to this book when I was an administrator at the Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, and I brought it with me to Southwest for a couple of reasons. The, the things that made it stand out to me is, first of all, it's not a book about education. And we often read only uh, books about education by educators for educators. And I thought it was uh, a little bit more brutally honest toward us than that. So that was one of the main reasons I felt it was a good book to bring to the academic setting and apply it. The other reason I was interested in a book that, that I thought at that time, what, 20 years ago now? 2001, yeah. 15 years? Um, at that time, it was, I thought, a much more honest assessment of, of leadership skills and leadership styles than other things that were on the market. 
And as I came to Southwest, Southwest had only had one president in 40 years. One president. No matter how good that president may be, you would think there has to be things that have to be changed. And so I wanted a book that, uh, that I thought would push the envelope fast and well, and Good and Great does that. And I would add that <clears throat> the question was tied a little bit to all the books on the chancellor's reading list. <clears throat> I don't think any of the presidents have read all the books on the chancellor's reading list. So I can't tell you this is the best book on the list, but I can tell you that I was in uh, probably my, about my third year as a college president when this book came out. It had been out a, a little bit. I'm sorry, I, it had been out about three years when I became president. And so um, I was always intrigued at the fact that, you know, colleges are businesses too. I mean, we talk about it at Reynolds, and I hope you all do to some extent. That doesn't mean we have to take any negative aspects of what a business world is like, but, you know, we have to balance our budgets and we have to have our customers. I know faculty don't like the word, but our students, whoever it is, our community contacts, they all have to walk away happy with whatever it is we share with them and, and offer them. So one of the things I like, I guess, the most about the book is that I, there's some universal truths that I think can apply at almost any point in time and in any, just about any environment, certainly if it's a culture like we have here in America. And one is that um, this notion of you're going to be as great as the people that you can attract and keep and continue to nourish and and uh, continue to grow at the institution, whether it's a business or a college or a high school, any organization, a church, nonprofit, it, you know, it's so important to get great people. In fact, one of the challenges presidents sometimes have, and you've all experienced this, sometimes a new president comes in, or even a person who's department uh, head or something, and all of a sudden they want to change people. Have you seen that? Sometimes new high-level folks come in and they just turn over. Well, you know, it's a 50-50 kind of a arrangement. 50% is attracting great people when there's an opportunity, but the other 50% is recognizing the talent of great people who were there before I came, for example. And then also finding ways for them to continue to grow, especially if they've been at the college a long time. Um, I was telling Witt, you know, that what I don't want at Reynolds is I don't want someone who's been there 30 years, but they've worked one year 30 times. That's the last thing I want, and sometimes that can happen. So this book, I think, has universal truths that are tied to people. It's tied to being data-driven. There are principles in here about that and trying to make decisions that way. It's also tied to culture, which is really big with me uh, personally, and that is creating a culture where people are comfortable saying what they really think. I mean, if they disagree 180 degrees with something that I think, I need to know that. I always want us to be respectful. You know, we don't throw things, we don't yell, we don't use bad language but we really need to know what everybody thinks. And I'll close with one quick comment. Um, early in my career, I would spend lots of time thinking about something, and I'd take it into whatever team I was on, and I had really worked hard at this idea. And damn, you know, people had different ideas, and they changed it, and my, my idea wasn't perfect. And I've learned in 20-plus years. Now I put as much energy into it. I go into a similar meeting, and if it's not chewed on and spit out and better by the time I leave, I'm really disappointed. So that whole notion of culture where you can actually look at things and give your opinions and reshape it and make it better, I think is really important, and that's part of the book. Thank you. Okay. And one follow-up, Dr. Dr. Eastep, uh, at Southwest Virginia, is there something that you're doing there that you actually uh, learned from, uh, from the book? I think we're doing a lot there that we've learned from the book. Our, my first year there was an intensive look at the book and how we could apply it. Particularly, it, it's really challenging the rural communities, like the rural Horseshoe Colleges. The Southwest is a good example of, of those, for sure. Because one of the things that Good to Great talks about that impressed me so much was, he says, first, first who, then what? In other words, get the right people together. In a rural community like we are in, um, we only have so many people to choose from. And so when we find good people, they may be in the wrong seat on our campus. They may be in the wrong seat on the bus, but we don't want to lose the person because who is more important. And so let's get them in the right seat on the bus. And so we've spent a lot of time getting people moved to the right seats on the, on the bus. We don't want them leaving Southwest because they're so hard to, to replace in rural communities like, like Southwest. We've got to find the right seat for them. And we have done a lot of that application at Southwest, that's for sure. What, let me say one more thing too. Gary brought this up. I would assume that none of us have read all the books that are on the, the chancellor's list. But I would also remind us, and I know you already know this, that 
when I looked to see who said this originally, I, the name that Google brought up was Thomas Aquinas. And the, 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 the quote is this, God protect me from the man with just one book. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. And presidents find that out too. And so while I'm a disciple, I've noticed, by the way, my copy is much more worn and torn than Gary's. But he left it in the window of his it. car. That's no, it, it, it sits in, it sits in the window of my office, which is why it looks this way. But um, even for those of us who are who really believe in what's taught in a, in a good book like Good to Great, let's not ever think that all the answers are, are there or we're going to take a lot of missteps. Well, that's a great segue to the next question is, you know, the, the book has been criticized uh, widely, particularly because some of these so-called great companies have failed. Uh, yeah. Citibank is one of the companies, or, or uh, Circuit City, rather, is one of the companies, <laughs> and uh, they've since declared bankruptcy. Uh, you can't find a Circuit City store anymore. Uh, Wells Fargo uh, has recently made the news for all the wrong reasons with their, uh, their scandals. Uh, it led to thousands of terminations in, in their organization. And, of course, Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae had to be bailed out by the U.S. government and by the taxpayers, uh, so th they don't sound so great. Why should people still put faith in this book and uh, continue to, to, uh, to, to read it or, or take something away from it if the great really didn't look that great? Dr. Rhodes? So I thought actually that was really kind of neat that that happened because leadership in running businesses or colleges is a human process mm -hmm. and there's no process that I know of that's a human process that's perfect. And I would hate to think that I have to be perfect. My colleagues who are here, we have a good number of my, my brothers and sisters from Reynolds here, you know, they know I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And so it, I liken it a little bit to raising children. You know, you want to do all the right things that the textbook and your learnings tell you are perfect, the right things to do, but then you still have to be lucky, right? Think about being in the right place at the right time. Some of, us, some of you are in the jobs you're in because you were in the right place at the right time and, and for other reasons. So that didn't bother me too much. I, it it kind of goes back to part of our culture where it's not, the issue isn't what mistake someone made, but how can we learn from it and how can we avoid from doing it again, at least the same mistake, and um, how can we get better at it? So companies, if you had a 50-year cycle study of this, you'd see some of them that went to be great and then went back down have gone back up and some have disappeared, those kind of things. Dr. Easton? I would agree with that. I, the, the fact that there are companies listed in the book that have failed doesn't really bother me too, too much because I think it's important for us to realize that whether you fail or, or whether you succeed, in either case, you, you've got to confront the brutal facts of what you do for a living, what your institution does for a living. And I think if you confront those brutal facts head on and early, there, there's less of the failure that we see with businesses, industries, and, and now we're seeing a lot of failures in higher education, especially on the for-profit side. Remember, uh, this is a, a quote or a, a thought not from this book, but the, the whole burning platform concept, which was really kind of hot a few years ago, and maybe still uh, is. No good, pun intended. That was good. Um, <laughs> I, worked up, I worked out on it. Um, but the problem with that is, I think that is the exact opposite of what this book teaches, even for the companies that failed. And that is, if your platform's on fire, just get off. It's too late. <laughs> and confront the brutal facts, which is one of the primary thoughts in Good to Great, will help you put the fire out before the fire starts. And so although there have been companies that have failed, if he were, if he were batting a 1,000, I would I'd probably put less stock in the book, figure it's all based on blind luck. Right. Wait, let me jump in. I'm supposed to go last since I'm supposed to talk about the... We knew he could do this. We yeah, I know. You knew that would happen. Uh, since I'm supposed to talk about the social sector book, but just in response to a couple of your questions that are pertinent, um, first of all, leadership, I think, is a lot like teaching in that it is both a science and an art. And I don't like management and leadership books because they try to boil it down to a cookbook approach. If you do these five things, that's it. And I think what both Gary and, and Mark are saying, it's the art part that has to be blended with that cookbook approach to leading to great leadership. And it's just like great teaching. It's not just a mechanical activity. It's a human interaction, and there's great art to it 
And I think there is the leadership too. So the book can give you a lot of good ideas, a lot of good cookbook approaches, but you gotta blend it with who you are, your personality, the environment you're in, the people you're with, the external environment, if it's gonna work. And just one other comment on this issue of did the presidents read all the books? I'm amazed the presidents read anything. <laughs> really hurt by that. <laughs> that includes me. Well, we're not surprised by that, but the rest of it really shocked me. We all get along pretty well, don't we? So, uh, so Dr. Friedman, let's, let's follow up from there. You know, we talked about criticisms of the book Good to Great. One of those criticisms was that it focuses on, you know, how do you define greatness? And greatness is defined as, uh, you know, you picked a, a bunch of companies that did really well in terms of the stock market. And you know how, how they performed well over a long period of time compared to the market uh, as a whole or on the average. Uh, it talks a lot about uh, brand, and it talks a lot about about uh, profit motives. Yep. Um, profit motives and and uh, you know stock markets are are non-issues in government and social sectors. Uh, what did the the second uh, the, the shorter version the the social sectors? What did that add? Yeah, and and the reason he wrote the little monograph on applying the principles of good to great to the nonprofit world is exactly what Witt said. He, he kept getting asked, well, how do you apply this to nonprofits? Because the, the definition of great that he used in good to great had to do with making profit. So the folks in higher ed or other nonprofits kept asking these questions. So Collins went back to the drawing board and wrote that little monograph trying to extend the principles of good to great to our world, to the nonprofit world. And the, the basic premise is to define greatness in the nonprofit world goes back to how well you are executing your mission. And that's the principle that defines greatness. I, I try to translate everything I read into my own words. To me, it's how indispensable do you make your organization? What would happen if it disappeared? Hopefully there'd be a giant hole of missing indispensable things that you do in your community or, or wherever you are. And that became the guiding principle for the monograph in what are the key elements of leadership that yield an organization that becomes indispensable and achieves its mission um, with excellence. And uh, for each of you, you can go in any, any, any order you'd like, but um, for everybody who's sitting here listening to you, in either of the books, are there any real takeaways, or what would you suggest are the most important takeaways that if they're going to read one thing or get one nugget of information from the book, what is it that they should take away? Well, I have one. <clears throat> so years ago, in my maybe 20 years ago, I had this theory about my work, and um, it was like I thought of myself as an air traffic controller, and I had people and budgets and these things all moving. I had to keep them from colliding keep them flying. Does anybody ever feel that way? <laughs> well, I don't feel that way anymore. I didn't like that because I realized air traffic controllers don't necessarily fly. They're not part of the most beautiful part of flight. <clears throat> For 25 years, I've thought of myself as a symphony conductor. As president, I have the full symphony. And I'm not the master musician for any instrument. But I have faculty in English who are master musicians at that. I have faculty in automotive who are master musicians. I have admissions people who know FASFA and they're master musicians. And my job is to know enough about all the moving pieces as the symphony conductor to be able to keep everyone playing the same piece of music in the same key at the same tempo. And when you can do that, it's beautiful. And the other part, the reason I mention it is because I'm president, so I, I get the full college symphony. But Dr. Janine LaRosen is our executive VP. She has a huge symphony. Amy Bradshaw is our CFO. She has a huge symphony. And everyone here is part of a musical group, whether it's a string quartet, whether you're in a department or something else. So the same principles apply, and that's my takeaway, is that you, we all do very much the same thing. It's a matter of scale, but the principles and the values. I mean, I interview the finalists for every full-time position at my institution. It's about 80 a year if the person mows the grass or is the executive VP or VP or anywhere in the middle. And we talk about culture and values and students and what we're all about. So. That's my takeaway, is the fact that we're all in leadership roles, but maybe just a different size musical group. And one of my takeaways I've already mentioned, and that is uh, the, the book helped me to clearly understood, understand that you really do have to confront the brutal facts. In higher education, we spend a lot of time dancing around the facts. 
and not necessarily paying a lot of attention to the facts gets to be a point where you simply can't do that anymore and I think this book brought that home to me. The other thing I will mention is the book's been criticized because of its sort of a reliance on stock market data. Well we have a stock market too in higher education. It's different than most but we have a stock market too and that's people. People are our stock market and you either use them and rise with them or you don't use them well and you you fall with them. And the book has a quote I really like, great vision without great people doesn't matter. Well, that's true. Doesn't matter how good we are at what we say or what we promote or what we try to bring forward. Without good people, you know, it's not going anywhere. And so one of the things the book's helped us to do at Southwest, I believe, is we have put the right people, good people in the right seats on the bus for them to be successful. And that, so our, our stock market will rise because of that. Dr. Peters? Um, I had actually taken notes and wrote things down. I had six takeaways from the monograph, but we don't have time for all that, or maybe we'll get to them later. But let me throw two out there right now that I think are really important. And you have to remember, in, in the monograph, he's really talking to the leader of an organization about the leader's behavior. That's really the focus. So I'll focus on two things there. One, it's not about me. Um, he talks about level five leadership. That's in both of them. And he, he, he draws the distinction between being ambitious for yourself and being ambitious for your organization. And level five leadership, which he considers the highest, is being ambitious for your organization. It's not about the I, it's about the we. It's about the mission, it's about service, it's about what we do together. And I, I've really been greatly influenced by that to the point where oftentimes I'll listen to uh, speakers and if they use I all the time rather than we, I get annoyed. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's one, uh, one, and I've worked, I won't mention names and none are in Virginia, but I worked for two presidents who were strictly ambitious for themselves. And I watched every decision being made based on what would move them forward rather than the organization. And I swore I would do my best to never act that way. Um, the second one I'll mention right now, <clears throat> the difference between leadership and authority. Um, and this is a key difference between the business world, the, the private sector, and our, our sector. And it comes to the point of shared governance and the difference, as I say, between leadership and authority. Uh, in the monograph, he tells a, you know, he has a quick anecdote. If I put a gun to your head, I can get you to do things that you don't want to do. But that isn't leadership, that's authority. Leadership is getting people to do things when they have other choices and they can do other things. And that's, that's critical in our world of higher ed. That's a part of our culture. And you know, if you follow in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, institutions that are hiring uh, presidents coming strictly out of the business world, the biggest adjustment they have to make, and often the biggest problem they have, is this difference between leadership and authority, where they're used to being the CEO and making all the decisions by himself or herself, or with a very, very small group, rather than the way I think we all work, having much more input, committees, involvement. Um, uh, I live in Charlottesville, and if you are a UVA grad alum or, or anything, you're following right now as they're searching for a new president to replace uh, Terry Sullivan. This has become a flashpoint in the discussion. Do we go outside academe or do we stay inside academe? And uh, to me, the big issue is the leadership versus authority issue. Um, I don't care if they come from outside academe, but do they understand that distinction and can they operate within that culture? Let me add something, Frank, because the notion too of, of titles and the title president, I probably say to someone once a week, the title of president is bigger than the person and it really doesn't matter whether it's me or President Obama or President Trump or at any level. I think it's true with other titles as well. And so there's kind of this joke about, you know, if, if a president's walking with some facility staff down on campus and says, wouldn't it be neat if those lampposts were pink and then come in the next day and they're pink? There was no official thought or directive or anything. So we have to be a little bit careful, too, with the authority because there's perceived authority, which is real, mm -hmm. even though it's different from leadership. So just make that observation. 
Thanks. I've got a go ahead. I've got a couple other questions, but before we go there, I'd like to open it up to uh, to all of those in attendance. We'd we'd like to to hear some of your questions for the for the panel. Okay. Over here. Good microphone. So you about, Let's um, grab a microphone. I don't need it. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so you talked about this idea of profit margins, and um, I really appreciate that you you know, dug in and said, we really do have to recognize that the models actually do overlap, they just look different. And so as we think about the areas of our institutions that are not traditionally associated with higher ed, like budget office, like human resources, those types of offices, really helping them to understand how they make a difference in terms of the output. So if we are looking at profit in terms of the difference between the cost input and the price output, helping those areas recognize how a decision that they make ultimately impacts the output of student completion, whether it's credentialing of a faculty member and that sort of thing. And so um, I come from a business background just by education and those things are really important that I don't see that we do very well in higher education, um, but those principles could be so critical to help push us forward, especially in light of some of our, um, the budget cuts and that sort of thing. So I appreciate that aspect of what I'm hearing about the book. Can I respond to that? Um, I, Rhonda, I think you bring up a great point here. When you look at good to great, he lists seven characteristics of companies that went from good to great. And when you look at those seven, I think higher education fits pretty well in all of those. It makes sense in all of those, but the one where I think we fail is the culture of discipline that gets offices to work together for the common good of, of the direction that we're, we're going in. And so we, I think that's where we fall down, is does the business office understand that that decision affects that student who now maybe will no longer be in school and forever, the president of Harvard once said, if, if you think education's expensive, try ignorance. So that student then fails and forever, and this is the case often in in rural Appalachia, Southwest Virginia, that student forever is being paid for by us, by somebody. And so it's that culture of discipline from office to office that I don't think we do as well as we do some of the other things that he talks about in this book. And some of it's very simple. Um, Belle Whelan, former president at NOVA, yeah. was telling me one day that she went and visited their call center years ago and she talked to someone who answered the phone right before heavy registration and the per she wanted to remind that person that the person was getting the same question 300 plus times a day, the exact same question. But for the person who's calling in, it's the first time they asked the question. So those little things too, I think, are important mm -hmm. in terms of uh, you know how we come across with our students. Other questions? <laughs> Just getting started. <laughs> so when we talk about confronting the brutal facts, there's a difference between confrontation and requiring change. Right. And so I'm wondering, just based on what I hear from different institutions and how they deal with from faculty advising and people not wanting to do what's in their contract to how do you transition, and I don't know if the book speaks about this, but how do you transition from confrontation to change and implementation? Let me, I'm not sure I'm gonna answer the exact question you're, you're asking, but on the, the brutal facts uh, side of the, the question, you know, one of my beliefs is um, before a decision is made, that's the time to speak up. That's the time to get your ideas out, you know, whether it's in a committee, whether it's in our meeting of uh, ACOP, whether, whether it's uh, your, your executive team, whatever it is, before the decision is made, that's the time to put your ideas on the table, justify, make your case, and so forth. Um, after the decision is made, that's the time to accept it and make the best of it. And I, I take the accept the brutal facts and I put it in my own terms and that's play the hand you're dealt. If you're dealt a hand by the General Assembly or the Chancellor or your President, the decision's made, that's the way it's going, 
stop fighting against it and also don't cut it off at the knees and try to have it fail. Take the brutal facts, play the hand you're dealt, and make the best of it. And Rhonda, I would answer the uh, confrontational part by saying I think that's where there's a difference between good leadership and lack of leadership. Um, you could give any group a set of facts and a problem and say we need to work through this, we need to, here's the ultimate end goal that we want, but I think it's up to the leaders to set the culture so that it doesn't feel confrontational mm -hmm. and to communicate very blatant information. And one of the challenges is often, um, nowadays we use the term false facts or false truths, alternative facts, because you know, you really, if you, it, that's where there's a challenge too, that's really not a leadership issue as much as is it a, an operational dynamic. If you have um, opposing facts, in other words, you don't have what we consider to be accurate information where you're all working with the same facts, that's complicating. But I think the tone of confrontation and having it evolve into a, we're on the same team, we can get there several ways, let's talk about it. I think that's one of the leadership roles. And that's why I think the, the term confront the brutal facts is important. You're not confronting people. As a matter of fact, you, you hope to bring those people together and look at the facts. This is where we are. This is the enrollment drop. This is the budget issue. This is the new program we want to we want to start. Okay, let's confront the issues that, that surround that and come to a decision. And so I, I think that we, that can be done. There have been a few times in my career I can tell you I've failed at that. I mean, people left the room in tears, and that's my fault, not theirs. I should have confronted the facts of the situation. I got too much into confronting the person who created the facts, but, but still. I, so it's always a delicate balancing act. Other questions? We've got plenty of time. Yes? I'll make a couple of suggestions. Um, when you were a kid in grade school and you were doing your math homework, do you remember the answer was in the back of the book? And you just worked to get to that, that answer? As a leader, try not to be the answer in the back of the book. If you're asking for input and opinions, don't have your mind made up already. People will eventually see that and they'll realize their opinions don't matter really. So one is to try to avoid that and to really be open um, two, I have a couple of pet lines I use a lot. Um, one is that we're all a heck of a lot smarter when we work together on something than if I try to just do it myself. And the other is, and this comes down to sometimes when I'm with an individual, especially someone who reports directly to me, and if I get the feeling they're just saying yes to anything I say, especially my bad ideas, I will say to them, if all you're going to do is agree with me, I don't know why I'm paying your salary. <laughs> the, the book speaks, uh, Jim Collins speaks to first who, then what. And I think that's how we answer that situation is put the right people in the right seats on the bus and then trust them to give you good, good uh, information. My people know that if they tell me this is what we're going to do or what we should do, that's probably what we're going to do. I rarely override decisions that are made by individuals or groups because I, I trust that we've put them in the right seats. They know the right answers. And so if they know I'm going to do that, they're going to spend more time making sure their answer's a good one because the failure may reflect on them. So it's, I think it's about right, the right people in the right seats. Not just any seat either. I mean, we, we, we had some situations at my college, and I bet you have too, where you had wonderful people in terrible seats. It, it was a, just a failure waiting to happen or already happening but you put them in a different location and they thrive there and, and we were successful because of it. It takes more time to do that, it's easier just to fire people. <laughs> so I would add also, um, in some cases, maybe you need to take a seat out, yeah. remove a seat, period. But on the notion of um, yes people, one of the things I've learned is, and it's not true all the time, but it depends on what we're talking about in a group. Um, this is where titles carry more weight in your title, if you're a department head or whatever. Um, sometimes you need to let everybody else talk first because the minute I say this right. is what I think, there are the weaker folks in the room might just lean in that.
that direction, which isn't what I want at all. So that's one thing that I try to do. Um, another thing is I, um, I ask people, what I tell people directly, I want to know what you think, you know, and I don't need to know. I want to know how you think my thinking is. I want to know what you like about it, don't like about it. Um, and this whole notion of triangulation without mistrusting anyone, I like to triangulate. In other words, I'll talk to other direct reports and uh, say, so what's the thinking? I don't need to know the name of the person who's thinking or saying this or that, but give me a, take the pulse. Give me a sense of how this particular situation is working out. Uh, I had a person on my cabinet once who's retired, but she would never, she would always speak up last if she spoke up at all. She was really brilliant. She was really involved with details. And I'm a big picture, creative kind of person. So I would intentionally, at the end of whatever the topic was, I wouldn't let us finish the conversation until I called on this person and said, okay, and she was brilliant at listening to everybody, digesting it, and coming up with some con com you know, merged version of the idea, which was terrific. But so sometimes you have to play, you have to, you know, you have to, as a leader, you have to use the talent that you have in a way that makes them shine the best. Yes, sir. <laughs> so first of all, for anybody in the room that doesn't know, these three guys are three of our greats, and I mean that. So I appreciate your perspectives here. Here's one of the things and, that I struggle with sometimes, and that's communication. And I'm not sure where the book, either one of the books are at, but you know, we can talk at the top level into our administrative councils about, you know, it's about student success. We're all part of this recruitment and retention. We all. And, and for some folks, it's clearer, and they see their role in that, and they, they get a hold of it. Um, for, for others, whether they're part of that central mission or, or not, it's a little bit more of a struggle. So I'm curious if there are communication techniques that you have used from the book or from anything else that really help. You know, maybe it's professional development. Maybe it's conversations. I don't know. But any, any thoughts about how we get that to seep down, not to middle management, but all the way down to that front line? Thank you. I just have one thought on that. One of the uh, seven characteristics that Collins talks about of successful companies, he refers to as the flywheel or the flywheel effect. And that is if you get a, a, a bunch of small initiatives rolling forward and being successful, more people will jump into that and you will have also more initiatives that are successful. So it's a matter of getting over the inertia, which I think is a huge problem on our campuses. That, that goes back to the culture of, of, of discipline or lack of it, um, and that culture of, of inactivity that it, I think we all have that exists in some certain pockets of our campuses, it's those small successes that he talks about as the flywheel effects, I think that helps us to overcome that. We've seen that on our campus, uh, our project uh, here, uh, and Diane Lester, my Dean of Student Success is here, and it's her, her pro project really, is uh, FACA. And, you talk about a, a flywheel on our campus, that was it. I could not believe the number of people who said, hey, this, this will really help. <laughs> this will make things great. We'll, we'll do this. And before, all we heard was FACA spelled, spelled a different way. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that my number one priority after getting great people, which is my ultimate lofty goal, is um, communications. And it's up and down and sideways, and folks at Reynolds get information a lot. We share a lot of information. We share as much as we can. Sometimes if it's an HR matter, personnel, you know, sometimes you just can't share it because of legal reasons. But um, purpose sometimes creates problems, right, in addressing issues to where we could help students if we didn't have restrictions. But I think communications is, and it's not really addressed seriously in the book, I don't think. But I've, I've learned over the years that that's, that that's, if I could pick one skill that my children would grow up and be great at, it would be communication. So I think that's true for all of us. Yeah, and <laughs> what I'd add, Ted, is um, when I look back at my years at Piedmont, I'm not the same person I was back when I started. Hopefully I'm better, I don't know. But I've changed some things in the way I do things. And part of that is the culture of the institution and, and maybe, you know, just trying new things and maybe getting smarter. Um, lately, we've done a lot of open sessions, right, David? Um, when we've confronted an institutional issue like the challenge of enrollment. Um, last summer, we held an open session. And, you know, we can do this because we're fairly small 
you know, medium-sized institution, we can all still fit in our auditorium and come together and we all know each other and we can talk to each other. And it, it's not just, oh, just the deans or just this group or that group, it's everybody. And it's an open brainstorming type session that we went through when our, it looked like our enrollment was gonna take a tumble. And we gleaned from that a number of action steps that we immediately put into place. And I, I think that was good for the institution. Um, the second thing I've started doing a whole lot more is um, l rather than assigning people to like task forces and committees, we're going to volunteers. Um, we have a student success task force at the college. Many of you probably have something like that. And you know, the old committee way, you know, one from this division and two from that and three from, we just put out a call, if you want to help the college solve this, volunteer. And it was kind of risky at first, you know, what if you only get two volunteers? But we've got really committed faculty and staff. They're wonderful. We were, I mean, the, the number of volunteers was way beyond what we could actually use. We had to pare it down. But you ended up with people who were there because they wanted to be there. They were really committed. And they've done a fantastic job. And we have continued that recently, having more <coughs> volunteer task forces rather than appointed. And I wouldn't have done that 10 years ago, but it's working. Thanks. So one key point Frank said, I think, is that he said he's changed, but think about this. Not only have we all changed individually, but our institutions change and our communities change. So I think it's important to kind of keep the pulse of all that and how collectively we as a college as a group that works together, how we evolve, and then also we have to know how our community is evolving because if we evolve that way and the community evolves a different way, that's not good either. So it's an important point. We've got about three minutes left, but I'm curious. There were several um, references to discipline or the lack of discipline and accountability. Um, one of the notions that, uh, that Jim Collins brings up is autopsies without blame. And in my role, uh, you know, my team's often called in when something goes wrong, when something breaks. Uh, autopsies without blame means that when a process breaks down or, or, or an objective fails, we don't, we're not punitive and we're not looking for who to point the finger at. Rather, we get together and to, dry, to diagnose what went wrong, do the autopsy, and use that as a learning experience so that we can get better. How do you reconcile uh, the two? You know, autopsies without blame, but uh, you know, to, to learn and not be punitive, but at the same time, hold people accountable. Well, if it's part of a, a healthy culture in my mind, at least what we aspire to, um, when people think about autopsy is a little bad because it means there's death, which is kind of a negative, that's a bad thing anyway. But my point is, when it's tearing something apart to see what's really going on here, there should be no negative thoughts about doing that. That's part of life, it's part of the daily activity. We do it ourselves, we do it in groups. So I'm hoping we have a culture where however you refer to it as an autopsy or something else, that people understand we should constant, we're in a constant mode of continuous improvement. No matter how great something is, we can probably find a way to do it better. So that needs to be part of the culture. I've been noodling around with a little leadership book that all, all I have is the title. And the title is, Have You Got a Minute? Because I hear that about 200 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I used to, I used to re regret it and, and not want to hear it, but I, I came to the conclusion, you know what, this is probably good. Because if you feel like you can walk into Dr. Rhodes' office or Dr. Friedman's office or my office and say, have you got a minute? You're, you're probably doing something that makes people feel comfortable enough to come in and want to talk to you. And they come up with some great ideas. And so having that, I think this is one thing where the, the, the style of the leader is a critical element. Do people feel comfortable when something fails? You know they're going to feel comfortable when something's successful. But do they feel comfortable when something fails to deal with the issue and move on? So. I, I think with my basic approach, this is just personal, um, my basic approach is to assume that people want to do a good job and that people want to be successful in whatever office they're working in, whatever task they're doing. Um, and my working assumption is they really want to do a good job. And if you start from there, um, most failures of whatever activity you're talking about are system failures. Uh, a lack of coordination, a lack of collaboration. It's not the individual. The individual really wants to do a good job, but some things didn't come together. So the first part of, if you want to call it the autopsy, is let's look at the system. 
you know, what, what happened in the processes, and let's look at that first. Um, it is a fact of life, though, that sometimes my good assumptions about people are wrong. But they got to prove I'm wrong first for me to change my assumption and finally get to the point of saying, hey, the systems weren't the problem. It was this person. Now we got to deal with that. Right. But that's the last step, not the first step. And when I was full-time faculty, I was always that way with students. Right. Dr. I trusted every student until they gave me a reason not to. So we're about out of time, in it, but I, um, I had the idea of could we create um, visits to the Shared Services Center in Daleville while people are coming? I stopped yesterday. I'd never been there before. This is a brand new organization. Think about it from scratch. John and I built a brand new community college from scratch in Maine. That's where we met. So I encourage you to stop by. If you didn't on your way down here, stop by on your way back. It's just right off the freeway a couple miles because one of the things that was great about it is the cultural, the culture that they're trying to create within this operation that's new and that's evolving. And a lot of what we talked about today, I think you'll see there if we talk to someone like Tom Sweat or others, it's really, really impressive. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you. And we are out of time. If you'd like to know more about the uh, Chancellor's uh, recommended reading list, the professional reading list, it's on the Office of Professional Development uh, website at opd.vcs.edu. Thank you all for being here and, and uh, help me give a, a warm thank you to our, thank you. our president. Thank you all. Brother Mark. <laughs>